The Man, Alan Watts, In Memoriam. A few close friends and admirers have gathered around the fireplace with frankincense burning, and we have come together at John and Tony Lilly's ranch in Malibu to observe what would have been his 59th birthday. Great teacher and illuminated soul that he was, he taught us many things, amongst which was the knowledge of the void. How were we to know that with his passing, with the stilling of his voice, that we would then know and understand all too well the meaning, the intense meaning of the void? The Associated Press and the other news services have what they call a morgue. And in it, there is a folder under W, Watts, Allen. And very matter-of-factly is listed who he was and what he did. He was born in England. In the course of his coming of age, he was drawn to religion and philosophy, becoming first an Episcopalian priest until 1950. And then, as he devoted his time to writing and lecturing and teaching, he was attracted to the religions of the East, and particularly to Zen Buddhism, of which he was the greatest and most influential teacher in this country. He was the author of The Way of Zen and Psychotherapy East and West and many other books. Uh, perhaps it was not accidental. Maybe he had some premonition of his end that in the last couple of years or so, he published his autobiography, In My Own Way. So let me tell you out there who all are here to experience together the void, to share together our sense of loss that his passing has brought about. John Lilly, scientist and physician. Tony Lilly, artist and psychotherapist. Laura Huxley, writer. Virginia Dennison, teacher of yoga. Oliver Andrews, sculptor and professor of art and myself, Herschel Lyman, communicator and student of religion. His daughter could not be with us today, but spent a part of herself, Joan Watts Tabernick. I'd known him for 35 years and two days. It's hard to remember anything but fleeting glimpses into the past, back to our beginning. He told me many times with an affectionate pat on my rear end and a twinkle in his eye that I was conceived on the common green in Chislehurst. He was always playful, joyful, a rascal. We'd dance in the living room, bounce on his knees to nursery rhymes, be tickled by his whiskers and giggle at the fantastic monsters, Buddhas and animals he would draw for us. He taught me how to get inside my favorite carved teak box. Once I lived in Chislehurst with his parents. I have fond memories of high tea, apple pasties, and doorsteps of bread smothered with Lyle's golden syrup. There were beautiful hedges in the garden, named Queen Elizabeth and Queen Mary. They were pruned that way. There were rose trees, and Henny Penny was my favorite hen. I quite often rode the common greens of Chislehurst on horseback with my schoolmates. There were hard times, family trauma, divorce. Somehow he always maintained a sense of humor. When I grew older, he told me what it was like to make love. I moved out of his life for many years. He became a stranger. I would see him once every one or two years and have to share him with followers, admirers, and disciples. Several years ago, I moved back into his daily life shared his friends, many my childhood acquaintances. A gathering was always an opportunity for a party, gaiety, laughter, wine and food. I felt a little uneasy with his way of life. Our differences gradually became intense to me. I was one of the new Puritans. He made it very clear that he enjoyed what he was doing and would die doing so and would have no one interfere with his enjoyment of life. I never said another word about his forms of enjoyment. 
It was very difficult to watch him age so quickly. He became tired and weighted with responsibility. Life was interfering with his work. Nine days after returning from a hectic lecture tour in Europe, he died peacefully in his sleep. I hadn't seen him since his return. By the time I reached his home after hearing of his death, his body had been removed, and Ajari was making arrangements for his cremation. With goma, which is a fire ceremony, his body was reduced to a small box of ashes, which I carefully wrapped in a furoshki. A furoshki is a kind of Japanese scarf to carry him to his funeral at the Zen Center. There, with great thunder and fire, chanting, his spirit was set free. Alan, die you in great courageous hero, founder of religious space, Yuzan Myoko, profound mysterious mountain of subtle transforming light, Dai Zenjo Mon, great Sumati gate. Outside the Buddha hall we stood in the rays of the setting sun, chilled and sad, and heard him laugh. On the ferry boat that evening during Goma, another fire ceremony for his spirit, My sister and I fed him rice and beans, tea and oranges, and a bottle of rum. I've known Alan about um, 22 years, since about 1951, when he first came to uh, California from Northwestern, where he'd been the chaplain, to uh, take over uh, the... um, um, Pacific School of Asian Studies, which is then being um, run by my friend and Alan's old friend, uh, Frederick Spiegelberg. And um, Alan arrived to uh, take over this uh, particular job and um, did all of those things that the head and director of a large uh, school has to do, uh, as well as uh, raising money and organizing curricula and all those kinds of things. Uh, at that time, Alan was uh, dressed uh, in a very straight business suit, and believe it or not, he had a crew cut. <laughs> <laughs> Those of you who know him from his uh, most recent uh, manifestation with his hair and his beard and his staff and his beads. When he became a later-day saint. <laughs> yeah. That's been very interesting and amusing. <laughs> for me to see this transformation of Alan and all during these uh, 20 or so years. And I knew I knew him in New York, and we did things together in New York, and I went to Japan with him in 1963, and we experienced that. And one of Alan's great qualities was always being there. He was always completely there wherever he was, and he was always doing the appropriate, sometimes... Uh, wildly inappropriate, but at the same time it was really the appropriate thing uh, mm-hmm. to do. So he always um, fitted and made the moment his own. And uh, many of the people that I've talked to since Alan has died have uh, had a great feeling of his presence in whatever way, uh, I don't know. But it makes me uh, confident that... Uh, in his new state, in his present state, Alan has a great future. <laughs> <laughs> How about you, Virginia? What are your earliest memories of Alan? Well, my earliest memories were when I was married to Henry Dennison, and we used to read Alan's books, and we could never find him. He was like a myth, because at that time he wasn't uh, as well known and didn't lecture as much. And uh, we kept trying, and finally one time found him at uh, Books and Review. And uh, that was the beginning of our relationship with him. And um, he was, as Oliver says, always present. And uh, there was that quality that he had of joyousness. And life was always an adventure. Whatever you did with uh, Alan uh, took on a uh, particular quality of vitality.
John? Well, I'm just a recent acquisition. <laughs> I think Tony and Laura came to me. When did you meet them? Oh, I, I've known Alan. I, I, I say I, I've known him because I feel his presence is still here. And um, I suppose it's gone back about ten years. Uh, right after the funeral that we attended up in San Francisco, I remember uh, an incredible feeling of loss and my wanting to ask Elsa for something of Alan's to bring home with me. Um, we were practically in Los Angeles when I realized that there was a package in the back of the car and that scarf that Joan was talking about and the picture that uh, we had used during the ceremony with his ashes in front of it was in the car and I could hear Alan laughing <laughs> and I felt his presence very strongly um, for the last month Lord. well I met Alan with Aldous and it must have been probably 1957 or 58 we were in San Francisco and we went to dinner in some extraordinary place you know he always had a special place and yes. special food and I remember Aldous and Alan they were just like two intellectual acrobats you know <laughs> jumping all over the place and, <laughs> and having a wonderful time <laughs> but really wonderful. I just look at them you know as I looked at the show because they were they um, the frame of reference, it was so, uh, so much wider than mine, but the, the feeling on that it was a beautiful thing, this, this brilliancy, this vitality. And then um, when all this died, Adam was so, so gentle with me, so, so wonderful and so understanding. I always remember the letter that he wrote me. And then uh, he was always like that. I feel in that, uh, I don't know if, uh, if, if everyone, but... Uh, he, had, uh, he gave uh, a friend a tremendous support and uh, to a woman uh, he always was able to make her feel her femininity you know, all oh, the time I mean just uh, this, uh, this yeah. I mean and uh, that lightness that he had in everything he had a lightness I was thinking there is a word in French panache which I have not been able to find uh, the translation exactly in um, in English, we use it also in Italy. Panache actually means only a plume, uh, a feather in a hat. And whatever his mood was, when I would, at least when I saw him, which was two, maybe three or four times a year or so, whatever his mood uh, was, he w always had that uh, chevalier way, with somebody that has a magnificent hat with plumes. And... Uh, would not ever impose on other people is, uh, if he had any any difficulty of course everybody has he would always take it lightly because he was capable of looking at himself and laugh which is such extraordinary quality <laughs> John I met Alan uh, as a sort of a voluntary act. I'd read his book, Man, Nature, and Woman, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. yeah. Man, Woman, yeah. and Woman, and Nature. Yeah. Yeah. Nature, Man, and Woman. And I, I read it at a time when I needed exactly what he had to say in that book. So I was very grateful to him. When I came to Esalen in 1968, I made a sort of a tour of the San Francisco area and called him up just out of the blue and went to visit him at his request and his boat in Sausalito the SS Vallejo and we had about two hours together alone and it was probably among the most intense two hours that uh, I've ever spent with anybody we exchanged ideas about LSD and its effect on our culture. We talked about his other book on the joyous cosmology and his experiences. And I was currently at that time planning a book, which later came out as the center of the cyclone. 
So we hit it off beautifully. And then I decided to tell him a story. And it is a puzzle. We call it the surgeon story. And I put him through this surgeon story in a and it's a particularly hard test of a given person. Uh, most people have to have their diet present in order to solve it at all. In other words, a man and a woman solve it much faster than either a man or a woman alone. Uh, Alan took the better part of about 40 minutes to solve it at all. In other words, a man and a woman solve it much faster than either a man or a woman alone. Uh, Alan took the better part of about 40 minutes to solve it. But he, when he finally solved it, he then introduced me to his wife and said, this man is as ruthlessly rational as I am, and possibly even more so. <laughs> <laughs> With a very light, laughing kind of approach to it. Alan and I, from that point on, we discovered that at that particular meeting that he was born 40 minutes ahead of me. So, as we said at that time, he earned the beard. <laughs> <laughs> so he wore a beard and I didn't. So he was your senior. Right. And I felt a, he was, it was sort of like meeting a brother that you didn't know you had, or a twin and one who had taken very different paths, and yet, intellectually, we'd come out at very similar places. <laughs> and it was rather startling to know, to see this. Then the next, uh, there were several important meetings we had together. The next most important meeting was a, a lecture that he gave in Los Angeles, which I attended, uh, with a number of people. And to see approximately a thousand people with him holding them spellbound on the stage at the Beverly Hills High School was really something to watch. It was just so beautiful. And after this particular lecture, I was invited to the house of somebody I didn't know. And on the way, the car I was riding in had a flat tire, so I didn't get there until about 1 a.m. And I walked into the living room of this particular house. And by this time, Alan had gone home. But sitting in the foyer of this rather, it's very large foyer, was this striking woman. And that's when I met Tony. <laughs> the next time, I, we then just... Three days later, we started living together, and we haven't been apart since. Did you realize I was responsible for that? <laughs> <laughs> I just found that. But you did not you know. know. We were, I was at the lecture with Alan, and we were going to this party, and I looked over and saw John standing in the uh, foyer there of the school. And uh, I said, oh, aren't you going to invite John to go to the party? And Alan said, oh, but of course, of course. And so he said, well, then he would be up later. And uh, before we left, why, John called and said he was going to be delayed because he had a flat tire. And uh, then all of this happened. It was such well, a I'll, I'll take this opportunity to thank you publicly. <laughs> <laughs> and I hope I can karmically do the same for you sometime. <laughs> so, Virginia, you didn't realize it, but you were the deus, or shall I say, the dea ex machina in that particular scene. <laughs> yes. <laughs> With well, a flat tire. <laughs> <laughs> then there was a the higher force. The had a flat tire. <laughs> then there was a higher force, a higher power. Well, anyone that's ever uh, been to a party with Alan present, uh, knows his incredible enjoyment of oh, yeah. having people together and uh, his appreciation of women especially uh, it was really extraordinary. He really did pay the compliment to a woman. It was so oh, it was elegant. So I mean, elegant. One time yeah. I bought some flowers at the house and uh, I picked the flowers and the way that he said don't touch it, it's just light, you know, as though it was the greatest thing. It was just a, a subtle, a subtle way of admiring a person, which uh, was very beautiful. 
Well, you could feel dimensions of yourself yes. that you uh, had not experienced before. That's right. I Alan mean, would always get into my Mediterranean uh, oh, yes. vibration, yes. and I could see myself from that point, you know, of, from view. That point of view much more clearly. <laughs> John, when you related that surgeon story, I can reminisce and say that's my first introduction to you at that workshop at Esalen. And I remember how that story baffled all of us. I'd like to reminisce a little about my knowledge of Alan and my acquaintance with him. Uh, I didn't know him as well as, as all of you, uh, but I used to attend some of his workshops. The first workshop I attended uh, was uh, in, at Kairos uh, near San Diego. And at first I thought he was a very austere man because of his stage presence and he was kind of frightening uh, because uh, of the way he appeared and the way he spoke with such authority. He spoke with the wrath of God at his beck and call. <laughs> and yet, interesting. afterwards... Yeah, yes, I never saw that. No, no, that's <laughs> interesting, but <laughs> afterwards... I well, Herschel, Herschel tends to protect that image. <laughs> 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 but afterwards, I, I I was so pleased to discover that he was kind and he was gentle <laughs> and he was a delight to be with. And the last time I saw him was at the supermarket. I bumped into him at the supermarket at Sunset Boulevard, Pacific Coast Highway. And uh, he was showing a part of himself that I had never seen before. He was just commenting with a certain weariness about the responsibilities that were his. He had a number of economic responsibilities, and he had to write more books, and he had to do more lecturing. Uh, the week before, I had the pleasure of uh, driving him from uh, his workshop uh, in Santa Barbara to Malibu to his friend Herman Lewis's home, and uh, I had a lovely time with him driving. Uh, I brought something here which I clipped from Rolling Stone, uh, there's an article by his friend Gene Marine, and uh, he. I'd just like to read a few things that he says about uh, Alan. He reminisces about the early days when Alan was involved uh, in broadcasting for station KPFA, which was the first station of the Pacifica stations. KPFK came subsequently, WBAI uh, in New York, and the station in Houston. And he describes his first contact with Alan. He said, as he saw him, who's the mafia type? And he's one of our stars. Talks about oriental religion and stuff like that. The little old ladies eat it up. Names Alan Watts. <laughs> Studio A was and is about the size of the extra toilet in an affluent home. One chair, one table, an old coffin-shaped carbon mic hanging down from the ceiling. And there was this guy with his hair in his eyes, Undertaker's black suit, string tie, cigarette in the corner of his mouth like a bad imitation of Bogart, talking in what sounded like a Midwesterner's impression of a British accent. He looked like somebody sent out from Detroit for a hit job. And then he goes on to tell what a genius he was in doing a program. Uh, he was scheduled to broadcast. Then the little light would go on, more or less at 8 o'clock, and he'd talk. No script, no notes, yesterday's news story or last week's discovery in biochemistry that he had somehow learned about or a dirty joke he'd heard somewhere. He'd weave it all together with Lao Tzu and the Tao and with incisive political comment. He was tougher politically when he was younger, and with that droll Lord Peter Whimsy, and with his truly astonishing erudition. And at 8.30, an eye would flick to the clock, and at exactly one minute to the second, he would put it all together, and you'd say, watching, my God, did he do that off the top of his head? <laughs> yes, he did. And students of writing could use transcripts of those broadcasts as models of composition. One night over a glass of the Irish that Wally kept around for favored broadcasters, I asked him how he did it. It's the kind of mind I have, he shrugged. I remember everything I read. I learned from the Orientals a sense of how everything fits together. 
so I can relate any two things I happen to run into. And what I found is surprisingly rare. I can remember what I've just said. So I just ramble, and when I look up and there's a minute to go, I say something about how it all fits together, and that wraps it up. Nothing to it. Try it sometime in precisely 29 minutes and 30 seconds. Then he goes on to say, we did some programs together, panel discussions on theological subjects. And Alan would sit back, cigarette dangling, and ask some damn fool question like, what do you think is God's responsibility to man? Then he'd flick a glance at me, and I'd come in with my best poor boy mission district accent and some adolescent question like, how can God send somebody to eternal damnation for eating a lamb chop on the wrong day? And somehow we would move in on the poor man from two sides because I knew what Alan wanted me to do. He'd put it together after an exchange or two, and it took the erudite Dominican five programs to figure out that we were jobbing him. It wasn't for enlightenment. Neither of us believed really that such programs enlighten anybody. It was for fun, like charades. And it was the intellectual fun we had together that I will miss. Little by little after that, Alan Watts went up in the world for a while. He did a show on KQED, San Francisco's public TV station. And I grin again as I think of him doing on television exactly what he had done on radio, except, except that he was surrounded by exotic shrubbery, wore a kimono. How did he pronounce that? Kimono. Kimono. And sat in the lotus position while he talked. No cigarette, poor guy. Without Alan, there would have been no Zen-oriented beatniks, no Beatles going off to the Himalayas, no 15-year-old God in a rolls to become Rennie Davis's basilisk. And without Alan Watts, we would all be a long way back in our understanding that there is a genuine culture in a part of the world where skins are neither white or black. But others can deal with that better, better than I. To me, he was a solid, sensual, swinging guy I liked a lot, who had a ball doing some shows on KPFK 22 years ago. I don't think there was a greater showman than Alan Watts, and where he got it, I don't know. And I recall at his workshops, uh, he would ask the question, what is reality? After a long discussion of that subject, what is reality? And then all of a sudden... And that he would chuckle and he would, in his own inimitable way, and he would say, and that is reality, and who can say that it is not? What professor can say it is not? John, uh, Tony was mentioning to me before that... Uh, that Alan had an incredible understanding of modern science and physics and you uh, being a scientist of the first water did you know of this understanding on his part or how he incorporated the whole thing in his philosophy I thought essentially he was an artist he, he seemed to know everything he was in a sense like a renaissance man uh, would you comment on his knowledge of science well <clears throat> Alan is sort of uh, polymorphous. He appears to each of us in an entirely different light. He appears to Tony in that particular way. To me, of course, and he, he would also tend to reflect you. And he was so polite and his formalism was so elegant that he would never encroach in any region in which he felt that you didn't want him to encroach. And since I was a scientist, he never discussed science with me. It was a... <laughs> and since I knew him as a Buddhist, I never discussed Buddhism with him. <laughs> so that we, we mutually stayed out of one another's territory in a very elegant sort of dance, as Tony can tell you. When I did workshops on his boat, for example, Alan very discreetly would get in the background and then start bouncing ideas off me 
and allow me plenty of space. See, I would start presenting something and then I would hear this very sharp, succinct, condensed comment or a magnificent pun from Alan. And he was a catalytic agent at these workshops. It was a, an incredible show that he would put on uh, in that way. There's no doubt of his erudition and there's no doubt uh, of the incredible speed of his associations. It's, it's just beautiful to watch in Miami, for instance. That lecture oh, he, he gave. incredible, I yeah. think. Absolutely incredible. One of yeah, our the audience was spellbound. There were thousands of people just hanging on his every word. And probably they did not understand the word. No, I no. He said they, later they, in our they, room that they, they he didn't know what was coming out next. Yes, he did. <laughs> I think, uh, it just came to my mind, there is another point in common between you and Alan. You both are theatre men. But the yes, the showman. He's more of the actor, and you are more of the. Uh, he's more the performer, and you are more of the stage. You are delighting. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you are delighting, and the sounds, uh, and the streets, and everything. But he's right there in front of stage and enjoying it. Oh yeah, moment. he was a star right yeah. out yes. in front. But I mean, can you imagine? Usually, people train and train to have that uh, that possibility of speaking like that fluently. Yeah. Well, we, since like we were born 40 minutes apart, neither one of us believed in astrology at all. But <laughs> as Alan said when he discovered that we were 40 minutes apart, he said it's almost enough to make me believe in astrology. <laughs> he made a great study of astrology when he was young. But right, and he abandoned yeah. it. Yeah. He didn't make no, I did the same he thing. Did. The only problem that I find with astrology, and Alan found exactly the same problem, you can pinpoint the position of the constellations right down to the last nanosecond, but you cannot pinpoint the variables inside the human being to the <laughs> degree of accuracy at all. And so we see projections of ex and expectations and hopes and fears put on people by the astrologers. And but it was marvelous to see John and Alan together. It, it really was a treat because the two of them would do a kind of word dance is the only way I could explain it. And Alan had the facility to take a word and stretch it and sort of throw it up in the air, a sentence, and come down in, in a form that you just didn't expect. And uh, that word dance that the two of them would do together was, was really a treat. A, a mutual friend of ours was telling me about an LSD trip they took with Alan. <laughs> and Alan began speaking and speaking hour after hour, and the friend couldn't get a word in edgewise. <laughs> and, and he said all of a sudden Alan became transformed in his very sight into a golden tongue. <laughs> <laughs> And that, oh, was the, well. that was the image that he had on this particular uh, well, he psychedelic could speak, experience. Uh, you know, no matter what, uh, he had ingested. <laughs> and uh, there were a lot of scientific studies um, that were uh, based on uh, his observations during uh, some of his trips. And he could speak no matter what. <laughs> I want to get back to Oliver here. Uh, Oliver was the one who crashed those Tibetan symbols, and he brought them along because these were some of the props that Alan used besides his dress, his kimono. And what, what else, what were the other props that Alan would use, Oliver? Well, Alan liked to make uh, instruments out of um, all kinds of contemporary things. As much as he, uh, as he loved the very rare and super refined, and even better if it was a little bit spooky and Fu Manchu-ish. And uh, <laughs> so he had many marvelous, uh, actually, beautiful, uh, rare instruments that he had collected in his travels, which he played with great glee, but he also had things uh, made of um, uh, blocks of wood, which had been hollowed out by his friend Roger Summers, and then he had a selection of instruments all made of uh, oxygen cylinders and um, uh, this kind of uh, cylindrical liquid oxygen tanks that, that are used on rockets, which he had sliced in half, built stands for, and uh, used with m much of the same effect um, with which he used the, the ancient traditional instruments. And it all seemed to me typical of uh, um, the widespread of Alan's uh, interest that he was able to combine these things which were junk with these things which were very uh, rare and ancient. And he used them all with great uh, glee because uh, just as his uh, voice was a 
magnificent tuned instrument. Uh, so he had a great appreciation of uh, sound and how it how it can be used, and has the great uh, magic quality of sound for turning people on. He used to play on. with his own voice. Yeah. You know, doing all of the sounds. Yeah. 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 Do all of the sounds. Oh, yeah, I remember and, too. Oh, he used to do that, and then that laugh, which we're talking about. Uh, I remember one time I was sitting around at Allen's and uh, feeling kind of down, and he said, "Well, um, how's your um, how's your spiritual discipline coming along? Uh, you <laughs> done any yoga lately?" And I said, um, "Well, yes. At this, at this time, I was learning quite a lot of yoga from Virginia." I said, well, as I learned some new positions the other day, and they're pretty good. He said, well, uh, I think I have one. Uh, I just invented a new one. Would you like to try it? <laughs> I said, oh, sure, yes, I really would like to further my spiritual discipline. And so I said, all right, <clears throat> stand up, now straighter, pull your stomach in, head up. That's right, feet together, toes apart. Now put your arms down at the side of your... Uh, that's right, line your thumbs up. Uh, all right, now... <laughs> Laugh. I said, what? <laughs> he said, laugh. And with that, first he gave out a sort of a belly laugh and then a kind of a uh, tremendously uh, guttural comic uh, peal of laughter and then a sort of a girlish uh, titter and then a kind of uh, <laughs> yeah, um, incredibly uh, lascivious snicker and uh, oh, yeah. then a peal of the most pure, he, heavenly, joyous laughter you've ever heard. He was his own mood synthesizer. He really exactly. was. I think some of that laughing is on one of his it records. It is on one of his yeah. Yeah. This is it, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Would you say that Alan was a happy man? Sometimes. Okay. <laughs> I don't think he was ever down, uh, really, for any length of time. He certainly yeah, didn't he let other people see it. Uh, but uh, he, he was never from, really uh, yeah. oppressed by them very length of time, I don't think. He, had he could bounce, let's say. He went down and just like everybody being able else. To put he space between yeah. himself and what was happening. And yeah, he had such an enjoyment of quality. everything, in sounds and whatever he would see, it would touch, he would taste. His perception was so keen and such a pleasure to him that I think that was one of the reasons that he could Yes, be. and as Oliver said earlier, that he was always present. Oh, present, You know, yes, yes. totally there for whatever was happening. So it gave him the capacity and he had a sense for of, uh, appreciating all of these things. Yeah. Because nothing his, passed him by. His sense of responsibility yeah. was really tremendous. That's yes, what, was what did he was tell me when you talk about a sense of responsibility? I sensed that, too, in his own integrity, but... Well, how did you see it? Well, towards his family and uh, towards anyone that he mm-hmm. felt... Um, towards his friends. Yeah. Oh, yes, as a friend, it was superb. He was. Yes, I remember I sent him the manuscript of this timeless moment uh, before it was published because I would have liked to have his reaction. With Within... 24 hours, he called up on the telephone, and he was very sweet. He said, well, you were in my day. I was going to pack today. I have to go away tomorrow, and here I cannot leave this book. But, I mean, he was so gentle and so beautiful, you know, given very generously. I mean, which, who, who can take a book and read it right away, you know, whatever, uh, leaving aside what happened and what has to be done, and so. Very, very touching to me. He was very gracious. He was a generous friend. He was a, a supporting friend. I remember once I took him the manuscript of a, a book that a young anthropology student who was a friend of mine had written at UCLA and who had given it to me for his looking at. And uh, um, I said, Alan, this is really a remarkable book. I know this is a person who's never written anything before, but it really describes some of the experiences that you really uh, know about. And I know you're very busy, but uh, would you have time to look through it? Uh, I, I gave it to him, and expecting to get it back in a week. That night, as everybody <laughs> slept, uh, Alan read this book, and um, in the morning, as I left, he gave me the manuscript, completely interleaved with comments that he had made on this entire book. I took it back to its author, who appreciated it very much, and um, that book was 
eventually the teachings of Don Juan by Carlos Castaneda. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. Oliver, uh, you as an artist and as a professor of art, as a sculptor, uh, know something about Alan's uh, knowledge and appreciation of art. Could you tell us about it? Well, Alan had a great um, sympathy, I think, for the art of all ages and times of his own, and of course a particular appreciation of the of um, calligraphy and um, um, the arts of the East and the art of India, which he particularly uh, loved. And I think the the whole concept of Indian cosmology is represented by the great frescoes of Ajanta and the caves at Elephanta and so on were particularly uh, beautiful and meaningful to him. But he also had um, really very lively appreciation of the art of our time. In 1969, I did a show at UCLA. I collected a lot of artists who were then using the most modern technology available to make electric art, art with light, art with magnetism, that sort of thing. And uh, I asked Alan to write the introduction to the catalog that I wrote. I remember I phoned him from Chicago, and he was, I forget where, and he immediately did this and wrote this, I thought, very interesting, penetrating article of art criticism and in a marvelous way uh, predicted a lot of the things that have happened in art. He predicted a, a an art which used uh, light and which uh, used people in which the means of the art would, would disappear and in which the window would disappear and open you out into nature and in, in which uh, nature and life and man would all become a really continuous expression of art rather than art being isolated objects and isolated incidents and uh, in a strange way that, that is one of the courses that art has taken in the last few years I understand some of you attended his funeral what was it like? Zen Buddhist sermon mm -hmm. what happened? There was an, to me the most striking thing about it was the incredible mixture of a kind of uh, magnificent bareness and austerity with an incredible richness. There was this enormous barn, which was really the Zendo, and uh, there was nothing in it except uh, a Buddha at one end, an enormous drum at the other, and a small dais in the center on which Alan's remains and the photograph of him were placed. And then in walked the uh, monks of the Zen center, all dressed in somber black, but behind them, uh, Roshi Baker, dressed in a magnificent gold brocade gown with vermilion butterflies and scarlet birds and with a high gold helmet on his head. And uh, he proceeded to uh, chant and to uh, talk about Alan and addressed Alan uh, directly, you know, saying, you, Alan, showed us this way and that way and so on. One of the most incredibly moving parts of that ceremony is after the chanting, which was all extremely measured, and the drum beats, which were also very composed. Suddenly, at the high moment of the ceremony, Dick Baker let out a blood-curdling <laughs> shriek. It just absolutely broke everyone up. He's like, don't hang around here anymore. Mm -hmm. Get off of that business, you know? <laughs> I had a sort of a peculiar private experience during that ceremony. I felt very much in contact with <clears throat> Alan, with his essence, and I could hear him laughing. And he said, if the Buddha were to walk into this room, he would say, I am not a Buddhist. <laughs> yes, no. I don't know where it came from. It seemed to come from Alan. <laughs>